welcome back to Daydream Believers with L and L. L, how are you? Doing pretty well. Pretty yeah, well. That's good. Oh yeah. How that's you doing? A surprise. I know. Not not like it's what I say it. But <laughs> <laughs> like it's what I say every single week. Um. Uh, hey L, you're well. Yes. Hey. Yeah. I actually really am well today. I oh, that's good. did something I've been meaning to do for a really long time and I finally was just like, no, nah, let's just rip the band-aid off and go do it. I cancelled my gym membership. Hey, it was about time. Good for you. Yeah, it was about time. Like I I do PT at a friend's house, which yeah. is good. And I had a feeling like if I would start that, then I'd like start getting more encouraged to go to the actual physical gym. But it just led me to working out at home more. Oh, yeah. And I feel like, or just feeling like I was finding it easier to work out at my friend's house rather than go to the gym. I think the gym, it works when you go with someone. Like when I used to go with you or when I used to go with my friend, it Mm. it felt like it was something to do and it felt like I didn't feel as insecure. I right, suppose. Yeah, yeah. Not even insecure might be the wrong word, but like I just didn't feel like everyone in the world at the gym was staring at me. Yeah. So yes, insecure, yes. No, no, no <laughs> I totally relate to that. And the thing is they probably were. Everyone no, said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just had this like I I don't know why the gym is such like a daunting place to go to yeah, and it's I get also it. a lot of bloody effort to a drive lot to. Of bloody effort. What the hell's the point anyway? I know. To live longer? My lord, why? No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I totally get what you're saying. I um, I felt that way the first couple of years that I went to the gym. Mm. But then it just disappeared and I went to the gym. I used to be at the gym five days a week, dude. Yeah. Like without, without fail. You without were fail. really, really dedicated, without I remember. Without fail. And then all of a sudden – you know, I've had a child and I haven't been to the gym in like <laughs> three and a half years. Yeah, very different though. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's like hard to go to the – but you were still doing PT after you had a child. I was yeah. still doing PT, but then, you know, I just – it just wasn't working for me anymore and I decided to just stop doing PT. But, man, I miss going to the gym. I miss it so much. Yeah. I, I guess do. It's a different type of like you time. See, yeah. I enjoy – once I'm there yeah. and I'm actually in my zone, I feel good. It depends yeah. on the time of day I go. It depends like the mood I'm in. Yeah. Like it takes a lot for me to get there. Yeah. And once I'm there, I like start to then think that like – like I said before, like everyone's watching me mm-hmm. or like – I'm so petrified that one of the people that work there are going to come and tell me I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, that, see, I always felt that way too. Yeah, I don't know. And no one's yeah. ever done that. I just no. think I've seen it happen to someone else. I'm like, oh, it might happen to me. I don't yeah. want people to notice. Well, I'm so conscious of the t- fact that like, are people timing me and they're going to know how long I spend at the gym? Ah. And when I leave, they're going to know that I was only there for like half an hour. I'm like, is that good enough or bad enough? I, I The things that go through my mind right. while I'm at the gym. So you think everyone who's at the gym... Is just focusing on what you're doing. Yeah, because I, at some stage, I am watching everyone else and I'm like, oh, that person went to toilet twice. Interesting. Ah, like, I'm aware. I see. I definitely um, feel as though people are watching me. Mm. But I don't know. It never really bothered me. Yeah. It never was – it never made me feel, like, uncomfortable. Yeah. Even, even in the weightlifting section, which is the most uncomfortable part to be in, if there was a free bench between a whole bunch of dudes, I'd be there. Nice. I would just go and just do my own thing. But yeah. I swear, I had this look on my face that was like, fuck off, do not talk to me. And <laughs> no one ever on, did. Like, mm. yeah. And no one ever did. Well, that's fair. I see. It's not even that fear. I don't know what it is. I think it's just like, just, it's one place where I'm very comfortable being on my own in a lot of areas. Yeah. And even at the gym, once I'm there, like for a while, I'll be, I'll be comfortable if I start getting into a routine of it. But it's like this anxiety if i haven't gone for like maybe a fortnight it's yeah. like restarting it's the anxiety restarting. again no, once I i'm totally in the groove that. i'm in the groove but it's that restarting yeah. and i think since covid that restarting never restarted yeah because at because one point was i was going quite a often significant yeah. amount of time yeah it made it really difficult and during that period of time my friend that I was going with moved to a different area so she could no longer go with me to that gym yeah. and it just became like a bit difficult this one thing that I did pay attention to and is sort of the reason why I was like, you know what, I need to stop paying for the gym. It's the fact that I was so conscious that I was spending this almost $20 a week Fuck, going expensive. to the gym. Yeah? yeah, I was so conscious of this that it led to like having this guilt in my head where I'm like, okay, if I want to work out at home, 
I felt like I owe it to myself to go to the gym to work out. Yeah. But then I could, all the anxiety would build up to the point where mm. I'm like, I'm not going to go to the gym, which means that I'm then not going to go work out at home, which meant I was so just not working So either way, out. you just weren't working yeah, out. Yeah, because of the guilt. Because I was like, why am I, if yeah. I'm spending if I'm spending all this money, I'm not going to the gym. Like, I, I shouldn't be working out at home if I've got this gym membership. Yeah. No, and yeah. then it, it like deters you from going to, deters, I don't even know what these words are. But like, it, it makes you not yeah. want to work out at home. But then also you, you're too fearful to go to the actual gym. So it just defeats the purpose altogether. And I was like, okay, I'm spending so much money. I've My contract ended years ago. And the only thing that's really making me hold on to it is the fact that I get free yoga classes, which I did utilize a lot. But at the moment, I'm like, I can do some yoga on my own at home with some YouTube or just go to another yoga class. So exactly, dude. I feel like, um, and even that, if that means I'm spending like 40 bucks for that week and I go do that yoga class that one week instead of me spending 40 bucks for two weeks, that and, I don't and, do and anything. Never, and never going for yeah. the whole year. Yeah, no, exactly. Totally yeah. Any weird things happen to you at the gym? Anything weird? Look, nothing like too peculiar that I can think of, really. I'm really trying to backtrack here. I'm thinking of all the years of different gyms I've gone to. Not really. The weirdest thing I can think of is like when I used to go, oh, I used to be really heavy into the gym. Like back when I didn't have fear towards the gym when I was mm. in high school. Oh, yeah. I'd go to soccer training and then me and dad would go to the gym together. Maybe because you went with your dad. Yeah, but dad and me really spayed on different sides. Like I was into the gym and my dad would listen to his iPod. And like just <laughs> do cash, what? just pretend to do a weight and then just like do go on his iPod. I'm like, Bless. dad, you're so lame. <laughs> but like that was pretty much the weirdest part of my time yeah, was just yeah, looking yeah. at dad being like, Pfft. This like, guy. come on, bro. this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Me like, oh, come on. <laughs> but other than that, nah. Anything weird happened to you? I don't know. The first thing that comes up the top of my head is one guy took my water bottle. What? Like he came up to me and he just took my water bottle. And I was like, hey, that's my water bottle. And he's like, oh, what? And I'm like, that's my water bottle. Give it back. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, I thought it was mine. I'm like, no, you didn't. I'm like, give it back to me the gym is the place where you are least you're at least a meter away from everyone i know so it's there's no chance that that could have been his there's no chance we did not have the same water bottle oh and he's like oh i'm sorry and i'm like get down with my space get me my water bottle back (laughs) how dare you away with you (laughs) you're like no you didn't yeah i'm like no you didn't think that (laughs) why are you taking my water bottle Oh, and I used to make up stories about, like in my head while I'm working out about people at the gym. Oh yeah, like you give them a whole life background. Yeah. Oh, I've done that before too. Yeah. Like there was this PT that worked there, and he used to always wear Converse Mm. while he was working out. Odd choice. Odd choice. But then that makes me think of Rocky because Rocky always wore Converse, and I'm like, maybe he had this like elaborate boxing career that I didn't know about. Oh, see, in my head, if I saw someone wearing Converse, I'm like, imagine his ankles, the cuts on his ankles. He'd have to wear Band-Aids all the time because I get cut. The cuts? Because whenever I wear Converse, my ankles get, like, thrashed. I don't know what happens. Oh. The back of my legs cannot withstand whatever Converse is giving it. Like, Oh, wow. I literally have to, like, I can't walk, like, at least, I can't walk for about an hour with Converse's on. It just ruins my legs. Get out of here. Yeah. Oh, I... Spent a lot of my adolescence wearing high converse. and low tops. Mm-mm. Really? Yeah, I don't know what is so it. The just ankle cuts ones the, cuts the back of my ankles. Can't oh. handle it. Yeah, I don't know why. But that's what I would have thought about. You're like must have this elaborate boxing career, and I'm like the ankles. Ugh. No, the only other weird thing that happened, and I think I've mentioned it on the podcast before, is those old ladies that really <laughs> had a go at me after like lockdown period of time. I went. I it was see. I think that's what really pushed me out of the gym, yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah. I, I actually gave it a shot. I tried to get back into it by myself, and then I I was on my little treadmill, and then I went to grab. I did the right thing. Went and grabbed my paper towel to go wipe down the treadmill, and these old ladies yelled at me because I grabbed two pieces of paper towel. <laughs> they literally yelled, like yelled at me, and then they kept like, like "What are you doing?" They, like that kind of thing. They were just like, "What? Are, like what are you doing? You only take one. You only take one." <laughs> and I was like, "Um, the bleh. and I can't panic when the old people tell me off because I feel like I'm a child and like a teacher's yelling at me. Oh my so I was God. like, uh, uh, so I quickly like wiped casually, and then I went and put in the <laughs> bin, and they literally watched me, and they were literally, sh- it was like they were shaking their heads, like. Like this the, little girl, yeah. Like the lady at Pancake Parlor in like the the little spaceships and stuff that in you know the ladies oh, at with, Pancake with Parlor the, with the spoon and she's like, 
Her head doesn't shake. It feels like it shakes. No, she just moves the spoon. It may as well shake in my head. (laughs) That's the kind of, I felt like I was being punished. They really, they really, I I actually get very paranoid. Like every time, even today when I walked in to cancel my membership, I I peeked into the little, like the, when you sit down on the bikes, like the lay down, like the more seated bikes. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, are they there? Where are they? Wow. It's like a little crew of them. Can't stand it. Makes me scared. Those old ladies. I don't like being told off by people older than me. They make me feel like I'm this big. Oh, no. Makes me. I literally have to. I had to sit in the car afterwards and be like, "It's okay, L. You, you're not five years old anymore. You're not getting wow. yelled at anymore. It's okay." <laughs> like, so that's, that's where your mind goes. Yeah, I get full scared when someone of like an older generation, especially a woman, tells me off. I go straight back to being mm. like a little kid. I feel like there's a lot of layers. There's there. a lot of layers. I, a lot I'm of like layers. an auger. I got lots of layers. Yeah. Like, like an, an onion. onion. Like Augers an onion. Are like, like onions. onions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And myself. <laughs> <laughs> parfaits are the most delicious thing. <laughs> Straight guys. Love me some parfait. All right, shall we move <laughs> on to formality there? Yes. What we like to do on this podcast is to tell you what was number one in music history <laughs> this week. Now, when I say this week, I mean the week that the episode comes out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In 1982, Don't You Want Me by The Human League was number one. Don't. Mm. Don't, Don't you, you want, want me? Her. Oh, every time I hear this song, I I've loved it from since I was a kid. But it reminds me of that episode of Will and Grace. Oh my god! And they're dancing us with the on, on the sorry, rooftop. Can... They're on like a little yeah, rooftop. Yeah, yeah. They're uh, it's Grace's wedding. Yeah, he's like I'm mm-hmm. working as a waitress, waitress in a cocktail, cocktail bar. Yeah, that's it. You think that would be a nice song for that moment, right? Right? But L, it's not. Oh, why? This song gives me the creeps. Oh, now actually. How come? It's about a guy who met a waitress at a cocktail bar. Yeah, well, that's what the song says. No. <laughs> I was like, oh. That's it. No, I'm no. just kidding. So apparently this guy helped her to become a star. Yeah. But then their love goes bad. Oh. Right? Listen to some of these lyrics that are in the song. I can't get over it. Give me the heebie-jeebies. So it goes, you know, you got your the lines that everyone knows. You were working as a waitress and me, 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 me. And now it's like, now five years later on, you've got the world at your feet. Success, Success has, has been, been so, so easy for, for you. you. But don't forget, it's me who put you where you are now and I can put you back down too. Oh, don't, yeah. don't you want me? Ooh. Don't you want me? Oh, that's You gross. know, I can't believe it when I hear that you won't see me. And then later on he goes, it's much too late to find. You think you've changed your mind. You'd better change it back or we'll both be sorry. I always sing those lyrics, but yeah. I actually have never sung them and actually thought about it properly. Yeah. Kind of creepy. Whoa, very creepy. Very, very, um, very like, you will do what I say, young yeah. lady. Yeah. Oh, ladies. No, not even. Like, that's okay. keeping me, like, director vibes, like, in all the, the cases of the Me Too movement right now vibe. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm, if you want to succeed, you must do this and be with ah. me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's creepy shit. Yeah, I mean, because then the rest of the lines are like, don't you want me, baby? Yeah. But then again, so the second half of the song is basically from the waitress's point of view. Oh, yeah. So then it's like, I was working at a wait- as a waitress. <laughs> I was working. <laughs> I was working as a waitress. In a cocktail, cocktail bar. bar. Anyway. That much <laughs> is true. <laughs> yes. That much is true. That is true, I guess. <laughs> and then she's basically like, the five years we have had have been such good times. I still love you, but now I think it's time I live my life on my own. I guess. Good for you, waitress. I must do. She has made it somehow. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It could be... A very, I feel like there's always two sides to every story, and she seemed quite dismissive of her side. I wonder what actually went down. I know, she but also he's like, way hey, seems like very I controlling. Good times, yeah, like, but it's just time for me to move on. He's yeah. like, hey, if you don't change your mind, then we'll both be sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, if I'm going down, you're going down with me. That's yeah, the kind of, that's the kind of thing he's saying. That sounds like the kind of vibe of like a guy that's like he's being your friend for a while, and he's like trying to be your friend and trying to be your friend, and then just so he can like end up being with you, and then you're like, "No, look, like I actually end up liking this person, or I'm doing all this stuff," and he's like, "But I've you been bitch. your friend. You owe me now. You owe me." Like, why are there people that can't like do that? You don't owe anyone anything for being nice to them and helping them yeah. and like believing in them. That doesn't mean they owe you anything. Yeah, I know. I don't understand why people think that way. Because they feels feels fool of a took that's what they are oh but yeah that that really put a twist to that song hey mm-hmm. yeah you know how you listen to songs 
and you're like, ah, don't you want me, baby? And <laughs> you're having a great time for all those years, yeah. and then all of a sudden, it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. Yeah, it's just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Like, like, pull on your collar, like, ooh, ooh, loosen ooh. your tie, kind of. Like, <laughs> okay, drop the phone. Okay. <laughs> oi, oi, oi. In two thousand and three, "Crazy in Love" by Beyonce and Jay Z was number one. It was. It yeah, was. So yeah, so yeah, it was. Oh. Yeah. I feel like this was the song, like, it probably wasn't like her <laughs> first first song, but I feel right. like this is the first song of Beyonce's that I really like knew it was just Beyonce by herself. Yeah. But with Jay-Z. But with Jay-Z. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I found it interesting, right, because, like, this kind of was the song that, like, they they did Bonnie and Clyde, I think, before this together, right. but mm-hmm. this is a song that really solidified them as, like, a couple. A couple. And like then they the got married. It, yeah. The it couple. Like, I don't think they got married until, like, 2008, but, like, this is kind of what, like, signified, like, what they can showcase together and, like, was the start of their, like, power coupleness. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, but I find it weird, right, because... So Jay-Z has topped the Billboard 100 four times, mm-hmm. and all four times have been when he has collaborated with a female artist. Uh-huh. The first being with Mariah Carey. Mm, right. For what? So they sung Heartbreaker okay. in 1999. Okay. Wait, and then the other two times was with Rihanna Umbrella. Yep. And Alicia Umbrella. Keys, uh, 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 yeah, Empire yeah. State of Mind. New York, concrete jungle where, where dreams, dreams are made of. of. Yeah. So yeah. It's crazy. And all like all songs are like actually great. Oh, and, my good. Yeah, and Jay-Z was already pretty well established, but it's crazy that it takes like that oomph of the yeah. – the, the like the Jay Z ness and that like big powerhouse singer to kind yeah. of like all four Getting of those there. women are very very talented like iconic women in the music right. industry yeah yeah so like the combo between one of the biggest people in like rap hip hop and that is like no one right yeah, top yeah. Well, there you hmm. go yeah I've got some comments to make about this song actually tell me tell me well firstly when it comes to Jay Z and Beyonce don't you feel like they're always part of pop culture jokes and let Mm. me tell you how so if you're watching a tv show maybe like a sitcom i'm thinking like a i don't know i don't want to say new girl but think of new girl type aesthetic show where they reference pop culture things if they do a new girl i don't know i'm just talking out of my ass here yeah someone will be like oh oh my god and like they're looking at their phone and they just found out some news and they're like oh my god and the person's like what did beyonce and jay-z break up it's always that kind of joke do you yeah. get what i'm saying i get what you're saying i feel like new girl is probably the wrong pl- like i can see wrong? why you're saying new girl but i understand what you mean like it's you they're usually the go-to they're like the angelina or brad pitt yeah of, of like the music of industry like the music industry do you get yeah. what i'm saying yeah there? there's that The second comment I want to make Mm. is I don't know if you were into watching all these type of YouTube videos about like the Illuminati. Oh, yes. I I, I knew you were going to bring this up. I'm Beyonce because apparently this music video was like her birth into Oh, Sasha Fierce. I actually read that before. Yes. And then there's no denying. It literally, when I was reading up on this before, it was like she has not like confirmed or denied. And I'm like, but I don't think so. The only Beyonce music video that gives me the creeps a little bit is we run the world girls oh yeah i still love that one because that one felt very eva net miage you know what i mean eva net join the navy that that eva net miage shut the microphone while i have a microphone (laughs) you idiot (laughs) i know but yeah that one gave me a bit of the the creeps but honestly I, i don't know i feel like i in like just before the 2010s hit the Illuminati thing, I remember getting deep diving into the YouTube. It freaked me out too much, and then I jumped straight yeah, back out of that. Yeah, scared the shit out of me. Yeah. Like, that video of It was of always when, Beyonce talk back then. It was always Beyonce or, or uh, Rihanna yeah. with Umbrella. Funny how Jay-Z yeah. is a part of Burr. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I remember watching that video of Beyonce where she's pregnant, and she goes to sit down in that interview, and her belly literally <laughs> folds in half. <laughs> and I'm like... I don't think pregnant bellies do that. (laughs) Yeah, but I feel like that's just for the show of the belly to announce it and then, like, you don't wear – it is weird to wear a fake belly, but who knows what these celebrities do. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's all I've got to say. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. 2012, Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen was number one. Ooh, so here's my number. Mm, Call Me Maybe. Maybe. 
I really remember mm. this song so mm. well and purely because of that YouTube video that like Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, Ashley Tisdale, oh, yeah. they were all in it and it was like the biggest thing ever. Were they in that music video? No, no, no. They were like, they made their own on YouTube and ah. it was like filmed on a Apple Mac. Do you right. remember like on oh, Photo Booth? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I read something about it. I don't remember, but I read it. <laughs> what do you mean you don't remember? <laughs> I don't remember. Everyone remembers that. I actually don't remember this. Wow. But uh, apparently, well, Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez, because they were like a thing at the time, they both tweeted about this song. They're like, oh my God, love this song. And that's what contributed to like its rise in yeah, fame. Yeah, because didn't Justin Bieber find Carly Rae Jems- Jepsen? 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 <laughs> Jepsen. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure like oh, he like he like s- not scouted her. I don't know what the word is for it, but like he was like the one that discovered her or basically, like took her under his wing. Basically, like how he was discovered. Yeah, with Scooter like was under the wing. Oh, not Scooter, Scooter. with Usher. Usher, 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 Usher. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that in 2017, apparently Billboard said that this has got the greatest chorus of the century? Oh, I mean, hey, like, I just met you. Keep in mind, at that mm-hmm. time, the century had only gone on for 17 years. Oh, so okay. It's a bit of a. I'm assuming, did he mean from 1970 to 2017? Yeah. Or did he mean from 2000 to 2017? In 2017, he said that. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's the worst chorus in the world. Like, I actually could. I wouldn't say it's the best chorus in the world. Well, but I feel like the at greatest least was, chorus for the century so far. Ah, I think, if I kept reading, yes, it said to that point. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> so the best chorus to that point of the century. Yeah. Ah. So in the first 17 years of 2017, Look, I, I would say that it is, although I feel like I can think of better ones in my head. I feel like it's more because it's kind of, it's not kind of catchy, it's very catchy. Oh, but it's, it's very catchy. The lines are like, hey, I just met you and this is crazy. Like, it's like. Here's my number. So call, number me, maybe. So call me maybe. Oh, like, very, very true. Like, it's very easy to go it's with. It's very like, hey, I just met you. This is crazy. Here's yeah. my number. Call me maybe. Like how, <laughs> it, like, how easy is it to just. Like yeah. in everyday life, just be like, hey, I just met you. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you've said it 30 times. Yeah. Here's my number. So call me maybe. I okay, I get you. I get you. Oh, yeah. mm. That's just that's just. I see. Thing. I feel like that is a good chorus. Yeah. Good yeah. lines. Good yeah. lines. Greatest, I'll allow it. Greatest of the century so far. I would say I don't think there's been anything better since 2017. So maybe. Although I feel like before that, I feel like the early 2000s, there was definitely some decent choruses out there. Some. That's an yeah. underrated area of music, I yeah. think. Yeah, I Very. really feel like... Everyone's like 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s. Early the, 2000s. The early 2000s have got the sweet spot. Oh, I like think a, so. Like a teaspoon of honey. Yeah, there's just oh, something a yeah. bit special. Something. There's something a bit special. S- something a bit special about <laughs> the early 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> now what we also like to do on the podcast is tell you who you share a birthday with yay that's Woo. where we pick a musician and we tell you when their birthday was basically <laughs> so if you were born on the 13th of february mm-hmm. share a birthday with robbie williams oh my heart bless mm-hmm. i really really Spankaroni. love him honestly love him so much I was such a fan mm. and even supported him during his Rude Box era. You know, Rude, Rude, Rude Box? Box, why are you so nasty? Oh, Rude right. Box, yes, yes, Rude yes, Box. yes. I was still a fan just because I love the man, but... Fan of the that, man. The fan of the man, although it came at the same time as Sexy Back and though it was like a com- um, competition to me at the time. Back. And I was like, Sexy Back definitely yeah. won that competition of bringing Sexy Back in that moment. Uh, but yeah. probably one of those people that make the early 2000s amazing. I agree with you. Oh, I mean, like it. rock DJ, a music video used to give me the creeps hardcore. Same. Although I, a song of his that I listen to almost every single day still is Come Undone. <sighs> Angel. Like lots of songs. Oh, even the one that's I played. I just want to feel real, real love, love, love that I live in. in. I 
Thank you so much. Love. See, you can't love not love his song. Yeah. Love that stuff. Love it. Hey, me too. Well. Love it, love it, love it. All right. That's it for formalities. We yeah. are done. Whoop, whoop. How good's that? So we have a great, I mean, okay, I need to, okay. I don't think I'm ready to announce what this episode is because holy fudge. It's a good one. It is such a good episode, guys. Yeah. Please pack yourselves in and get ready for... Pack yourselves in or I, strap yourselves okay, in? Okay, that's the word. Make sure you pack yourself in your suitcase. Yeah, no, strap yourselves in because yep. it is an episode you will not want to miss. Ooh. Get yourself comfortable, pop on some, like, comfy clothes and yep. get yourself a hot chocolate and listen to the episode because yeah. it is one that, honestly, it's going to... I think I'm going to say I'm. this is someone that literally... It's like a dream come true in terms yes. of like my inner child completely needed this yes. this conversation. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, let's announce it all. Mm-hmm. We are talking to Angela Featherstone. If you don't recognize that name, you might recognize her as Linda, who left Adam Sandler at the altar from The Wedding Singer. Ah, yeah. Literally, hey, Linda, you're a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> can't do it oh guys oh my god this is someone uh, as anyone that's a listener will know yep. wedding singer is by far the movie of our lifetime yes yes, yes and yes, yes, yes. to speak to someone not only from that movie but to speak to such an iconic woman someone that is so so amazing in yep. everything she does and has yep. such passion for what she touches and why she yes, touches it yes. in the world I'm, I'm just so so honored to be able to speak to her same here Elle, and like, as people know, she was also in Seinfeld. She was also in Friends. So she's played some very iconic characters. Yeah, but she was J- Jerry's maid on Seinfeld. Jerry's maid, exactly that he right. May have had altercations with. Yeah. And she was the copy girl from Friends that Ross and Rachel had their infamous break. Yes, we were on a, a break. break situation uh-huh. on. Yes, yes, yes. But acting roles aside, mm-hmm. like these amazing achievements that she has done aside, this woman has lived a life. Mm. And it is uh, completely heartbreaking, but also so inc- incredibly inspiring because of what she's doing today. I'm not going to give it away. Let's let Angela tell this story. But this is a woman that is saving lives and changing the world. 110%. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. She's fucking amazing. She's honestly, guys one of my favorite people in this world favorite people and angela if you're listening to this we freaking love, love you. you we love, love you so much holy thank you molly thank you sweet baby jesus but we're going to take a quick break but before we get to angela we must ask you a few things yes if you could please follow us on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts you know the drill yeah and also tell a friend tell a friend tell a family member yep anyone um, or tell a random person on the street who yes. cares just tell someone just tell them just tell them just tell someone and if you like what you're listening to please don't forget to rate us a five out of five yes. it really helps us out it, oh, boy does it yes boy oh boy does it ever it really does yes and you gotta get cracking on it because like get cracking get cracking I don't know what the whoop was, but yeah. All right, we'll be right back with Angela. Why we've wanted you to be on the show as well is just because it's it's so lovely to hear someone's like the background behind someone that we've we've basically seen you as this character our whole lives, like childhood lives, but to understand the background of you and and to hear your story and, and what you're able to accomplish in your life now is really, really inspiring. We know that you grew up in the foster care system. We'd love to learn a little bit more about your your perspective on that because we know it's something that, at least from our circles, mm. is something that has a lot of, like, I think a lot of people are a bit ignorant around what that actually looks like and what that system is actually like. Mm. I'd love to hear your take and from what the perspective of, of the foster care system is like and especially around aging out. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, not bad for one o'clock in the morning in Australia. <laughs> oh yeah, one Thank o'clock. You. I know you guys are firing. I want I, to be fair. I don't go to sleep till like two thirty. Anyway, yeah, so it's fine. This is the norm. So <laughs> yeah. So just to be super clear, I didn't grow up in the system. It's not oh, you. Yeah. It's okay, everyone. Yeah. Everyone assumes yeah. that. But yeah. I was I was a late bloomer. Um, basically, uh, I went into foster care at sixteen. Right. And I okay. went into 
uh, I went into foster care through the uh, juvenile justice system, and then I I stayed there for a year and a half before I realized that it was never going to happen. Like I was never going to, I did not like the foster care system. It's not like the group homes I didn't like. Um, There's a lot, there's a lot of problems with it, many, but uh, yeah. And then at 17 and a half, I uh, begged the judge to emancipate me because I kept coming, I kept going AWOL and yeah. it was AWOL. Uh, there was, you know, I was just building and building and building uh, my criminal record because I kept going AWOL and having to, you kept, it's Ill- illegal to run away from a group home, like all this oh, stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah. All this stuff. It's just a whole, you know, it's not an accident that there's a foster care to prison pipeline. You know, yeah. you, it's like, not only do you become codependent on a system, where your personal and individual needs are not being addressed, much less meet met, but also you just like you have a criminal record. It's it's that easy. I went mm. into the foster care system because of uh, the justice system, but uh, a lot of people, like I said, like the second you go, hey, well, you're 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 get you're getting a criminal yeah. case, and then also. There's a lot of other uh, subsidiary pipelines. You know, the 80% of all uh, trafficking survivors are from the foster care system. And there's just, you're so profoundly vulnerable because you technically are, I'll say incarcerated, but technically mm-hmm. you're, you're governed by the state or the, you know, the, the government, the province, mm-hmm. whatever applies in your particular country. But you're actually not being uh cared for so you're profoundly vulnerable you have a, there's authority but no responsibility per se i i asked to be emancipated and i had um on one of my uh bouts of being a wall i had i got like three jobs i knew that i was gonna have i knew that i wasn't gonna survive in the foster care system but i knew that i would have to prove that i could do it on my own so i got three jobs and i showed up with the judge and said, like, I have these three jobs. I can't survive in the group homes, which as I would, I really would have just killed myself if I had to there so much neglect, so much violence, so much deviant. Like it just, it's not, it's not like a home. It's yeah. a, it, it's like prison basically. Yeah. Yeah. So was there, was there also a lot of conflict with the other kids that were there? Was that part of, of it? Yeah. 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 A lot, yeah. yeah. Because you're getting traumatized kids from all, you know, different. Some have been in the system their whole lives. Some have whole just lives. like brand new that day. Some people just come from, you know, a, 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 like just horrendous trauma, and others not as much. You know, if you're yeah. picked up, if you uh, in Canada, there's a. Uh, a massive First Nation representation in foster care. It's like seventy-five percent at least, depending on the province. But they're they're very overrepresented to say the least uh, in the foster care system. So if you like, for example, if you're a First Nations kid, and most of the reservations in Canada are, are very far north, yeah. Um, yeah. So that, you know, keep everybody kind of separate and it's very hard, especially because it's so cold up there in the winter months. Like if you actually get away from the reservation or if you if you leave the reservation, it's very difficult to get back to the reservation. And also it's a lot colder up there and often the the snows aren't always plowed or ice, the ice. It's like so it's a big thing. And so if you're there and you're picked up on the streets, well, they're going to put you in foster care yes whatever you asked the answer is no, yes like you answered for you. no that's <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine like I um I volunteer for the homeless here in Melbourne and I was actually one of the one of the boys I met on the streets the other week he was 16 years old and he had been basically kicked out of home and one of the people I was with asked the question of as to like oh how are you going in terms of finding housing like is there a foster care system and he's pretty much gone AWOL 
and basically chosen to live on the streets because it is safer for him on the street than it is in those housing, that housing. And that's in in a whole different country yet still so relatable because I don't think people realize that like, yes, you might be giving someone a shelter and a space to live in. That doesn't mean that they're getting the needs they need to mm. survive in life or safety. Yeah. It's yeah. not just because you have a roof of your head doesn't mean you're safe. Um, it's beautifully said, by the way. Well, thank you. Well, it's yeah, coming from it's you. Very- <laughs> <laughs> and also, it's not, not only that, but I believe that children have the right to, to have their, their individual souls cared for. I believe yes. that that's a human dignity yeah. that children should be tended to yeah. individually. Yes, exactly. Um, One, and every if child has that right, yeah. I think so. I think so. I mean, I think as adults, even, we, sh- we, we deserve that. But I think it's unconscionable not mm. to give that to children. Um but yeah, I think we would all fare a little bit better if we tried to tend more to the individual souls of, of each other. Yes, it's true. Uh, that was my experience too. It was safer on the streets than it was at home and it was safer uh, on the streets than it was at the group homes. Makes total sense. Yeah. So I think you before we asked the next questions, you were going into how you found those three jobs um, and you kind of went to the court. So I know one of those jobs, um, having done my little researches, um, was run by like a mafia trafficking mm-hmm. kind of, was that well, one of, the, yeah, one that of was, those jobs? Was, yeah. <laughs> yes, let's get, let's fine tune that because yes, you're right. Yes, yes. So I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm remembering <laughs> three words, but it's not making sense. That was one of the jobs that I showed <laughs> no. up with. Um, oh, yes, good point. Oh, yeah. yes, Ooh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm not like, and guess what? Um, <laughs> No, I uh, yeah, I had a, I had a I got a job washing dishes at Moscovitz and Moscovitz, and I got a I was a live-in nanny for a wonderful woman uh, oh. who had two kids. She was divorced. She had two kids, and she was uh, working full time, and she needed someone to take care of the kids when she was at work. And so I I lived at her uh, place and uh, took care of the kids in exchange for having a safe place to yes, sleep. Wonderful. Yeah. And then the third job I worked at, a, I got a job uh, fairly easily at a clothing store, which now would have been a red flag for me. But at the time, I just was so happy because I had, um, you know, I didn't have any clothes to wear. I had been, you know, I left home with nothing other than the clothes on my back. And so uh, I wanted, you know, I'd been uh, shoplifting clothes for a while, which is how I got into um, foster care. Right. And this yeah. is like a really super stylish, uh, cool clothes shop that was really trendy at the time. And I got a job there and they didn't really seem to care that I didn't sell very well. And But I got to wear the outfits at work and I got to take them home sometimes. And then, yeah, it turns out that uh, one of the people that worked there was actually with um, Mafia out of Montreal and was there... Uh, um, you know, he was a sex trafficker. I I can just imagine the like at the age that you were, you were saying like if you if you were you now, you would have picked up on the red flags. But you were so young, so mm. like you've been through what you have been through, but that innocence of being an adolescent was still there with you that you didn't pick up on those signals. Like it's it just it makes me really sad um, that. That that's how you and that's how kids find themselves in these situations because you're trusting you've got this kind of innocent trust that you're going to be okay because someone can make you feel safe and that's what's really fucking and sad. someone's also showing their trust yeah. in you which not a lot of people at that stage of yeah. your life i assume were putting trust their trust in you so to give you the trust of giving you that job it's very easy to then trust that person initially yeah. i suppose I think that's a really good point you guys are making because I think what's important to remember, which doesn't come up a lot because Mm -hmm. there's such a a assumption that there's something wrong with the kids in foster care. No, sometimes they, you know, they are deviant and sometimes they do have other issues. Sometimes they do have autism. Sometimes they do have uh, chemical imbalances. Sometimes they just have such complex PTSD from all the trauma and also there there's 
there's everyone in foster care is unique. Like there's yeah. almost 500,000 kids on foster care. And I can guarantee you that they're not all the same, although it would be convenient if they were all the same, because then one size would fit all. And it would be, they probably wouldn't need um, so many psychotropic drugs because one in four kids in foster care is on five or more psychotropic drugs. Wow. And so, Ooh. you know, if everyone was just one size fits all, you could imagine that you could meet all the individual needs of all the 500,000 kids with one, you know, one pill, one, yeah, no, yeah. Not literally a pill, but with one fix it, you that know, solution. Yeah. But everyone is unique. And in my situation, for example, while in my mind, I was pretty tough because I had survived um, a fair amount of abuse growing up. And also I was brave enough to leave home and go onto the streets, which was, it was minus 30 degrees that winter. It's, a, it's minus 30 degrees every winter yeah. in Winnipeg. Um, and it certainly was that winter. So I was like braving, you know, the cold, yeah. of what was at home. Um, but I, it's true also that like I hadn't, I was um, raised very religiously. Um, so I did not, I had not watched TV. I'd never been to a movie when I left home. Um, I don't think I'd ever really even seen a movie um, wow. or anything. I'd never been on a date. I was, you know, um, I, I think not to be too graphic, but I had just lost my virginity. Mm. So, and I had, so there was no, there, and there, had, so I was, I was in retrospect pretty in it pretty innocent in yeah, that sense. Yeah. Like, again, I was intelligent. I I was tough because I had to be to survive. I we we grew up without a lot of, you know, material things. Yeah. And so um, you know, like I said, I had to if I want I was, you know, I've been wearing hand me downs for years and years and just like remodeling the hand-me-downs every couple of years. Like I'd cut yeah, them, yeah. I'd yeah. them in like curved tiles <laughs> and stuff, but technically they were like three-year-old hand-me-downs. And so for me, uh, you know, and maybe that's a flaw in my character, but I, at being in high school at a new school in a very affluent neighborhood, I felt pretty strange and weird and could not handle uh, I needed, like, I wanted, really wanted, like, a new pair of jeans. And getting a new pair of jeans was completely out of the question. Um, and I, w I had jobs. I had, oh, I had my first job uh, at 12 years old. I had my first business at 12 years old, <laughs> um, mowing lawns and babysitting and gardening and uh, shoveling sidewalks to, to make some money. So it's not like I wasn't, um, you know, working a hard worker or I wasn't trying, but you, I just wasn't gonna make enough money where I could also where I could survive support myself and also mm -hmm. have a new pair of jeans so anyhow I'm certainly not defending it but yes everyone on the street I think is uh and in foster care particularly everyone is individual we all have our unique paths some people we all have different levels of trauma and different kinds of trauma yeah, and of yes true not everyone that goes into foster care has you know had you know the same kinds of experiences much less the same kinds of trauma yeah. oh 100 percent. you can't just whip a label of like foster kid and just assume that they're like what's they portrayed all, on tv yeah. in like the two, early 2000s like it's not that it's yeah. not as simple as every foster kid is like a one fits all yeah and I 100%. want to say, I, I don't think that was a flaw in your character. Oh, I was going to say the same thing, uh, yeah. I, I, I think you were just a, a teenager. <laughs> yeah, it's hard when you're in that environment. Yeah, you're just you know. constantly, it's hard not to be pinpointed and think that, like, it's only a natural feeling to feel like you need to belong. Yeah. And when you notice yourself not having those pair of jeans that yeah. everyone else seems to have, mm. it's only your natural instinct to feel like, I need to get those jeans yeah. so that I have a, you want my it. people. Especially yeah, being, you want to being in. in the foster care. You want to fit in. You want to be accepted. You don't, you know, you don't. It depends, you know. It's not just about not being weird or standing out. But also, I found I found the abuse that I was experiencing at home to be um, 
you know, quite oppressive, oppressive. And I think there was a significant amount of mental illness going on um, at home. And uh, that, you know, at times, I mean, it was criminal, but at times it also crossed into deviance. And it just, it was a lot to process and to handle. And I just think that, yeah, the smallest thing that I could do or have that made me feel like I just sort of didn't stand out quite so much in the world would have been amazing. And just so you know, recently I started um, creating a, a an app for kids in foster care to have where we uh, gamify their uh, ability to take control of their life, like set their own appointments for court, set their own appointments with their social worker and with their probation officer, if that's uh, relevant. Uh, but setting up their own, you know, with their doctor's appointment with so their therapist, so that they begin to have that sense of control and autonomy. Right. But also what I love about this is exactly what we're talking about. What I what I really think is a part, certainly I don't know for boys, I can't speak to that, but I know for me, in my situation, the materialism, the financial part, because we are, you're right, we're talking about teenagers and there's yeah. a natural instinct for like hives. You want to fit in, right? Of you want to be attractive. You want to be, you know, you're starting to to come into your sexuality and, uh, or at the very least, you know, you're having hormones raging and there's of a, course. there's a, thing where you want to have a pretty blouse it's a thing where you if you're you know you more you want to have cool sneakers and stuff like that and so we're we're gonna make it so that if you take charge of your own life by setting your appointments and making you know so that you have a little bit of you know your schedule and you start to become individuated and autonomous or reigning over your own life at an earlier age I mean they the thing is, is that they're of age to be doing that. And if they mm -hmm. were in a safe family, they, that would be being nurtured in them. Yeah, yeah exactly. In foster care, it's deviant behavior because you need to just sit still and shut up because someone's getting paid to to make sure that all hell doesn't break loose. And so there's no none of that. There's no it's just codependence, which leads to codependence, which leads to prison, which leads to suicide, which leads to homelessness, because they've never been encouraged to have those individual skills. But I also think is really important is that when you do all of those things, you get points and dollars so that you can get pretty blouses and cool oh my runners. Gosh. And we want to we want to partner with, you know, some of the really big um, shoe companies and the clothing company so that the, the kids can get like, oh, I made this appointment and I made that appointment. I get X amount of dollars to buy a blouse and then oh they get. Oh my gosh, something. that is wonderful. Thank you. Because if I had had that, I wouldn't have been trafficked because yeah, I, oh my it. God. Because I wanted cool clothes. That's wild. It you know what? It works in so many ways, but I love the fact that you mentioned individuality because that, that process alone of buying your first piece of clothing item on your own, that you get to choose what yeah. you're going to look like. You, it's not because you're, whether you're your in mom, the foster care yeah, system or not, yeah. but whether your mum chose all your clothes for you or whether you were just wearing clothes because everyone else was wearing those type of clothes or really self define yourself. Yes. Get to like discover yeah. what you like. Mm. I think that's a re in so many ways is such a awesome thing. Awesome, awesome thing. thing. Yeah, that's I think, fantastic. I think, I think because they, there's a lot of focus on um, children that are trafficked and it, it being about their need for love and their need for attention and, and that vulnerability that is obviously engorged because of the deprivation that they're experiencing in foster care. I think that when, when you experience taking control of your life, that will build self-love mm. that builds self-esteem it's yeah. the vulnerability that's being caused by oh just there's like 14 rooms with you know 18 20 kids and one psychology student or you know social work student sitting in an office with the door closed doing you know watching tv or reading for for school who's in charge of all of these kids that's 
that that is you know that's tending towards this this in, in increasing uh vulnerability emotionally right yeah the the answer isn't oh have a bunch of people come and give you a hug Mm. And the answer certainly isn't having, um, you know, a, a sex trafficker come in and tell you that they love you and then sell you for sex. The answer to me is what well, is inevitable anyway, but let's just start doing it now, which is the, the self-acceptance and the self-appreciation and ultimately the self-love that comes from, I've got this. Yeah, I got it. I'm going to make this appointment. I'm going to show up for that appointment. I'm going to have them say, great job. You showed up. Now we'll, now that you've shown up, you, we're going to do this thing and we'll tell the court this thing. And you're, you know, you're, you're taking charge of your life. This will, those are skills that, by the way, will help it with careers, oh my gosh, yeah. college. They'll help with everything. But I think that it will, it'll also, it's the vulnerability that makes you so vulnerable uh, vulnerable to sex traffickers. Of course. But if you're like hustling, if you got your own hustle and your self-love and individuation is increasing, why would you want to take time out of your busy life to go, you know, maybe, maybe, but I just don't think you're going to be yeah. as vulnerable. I really don't. I, I, I agree I with you. That. And I think also as a kids who have been deprived of love perhaps their whole lives uh, in this situation to suddenly have someone give you that love. It's hard to accept if you feel like you don't deserve it because you never got it mm -hmm. to accept. Love is to also love yourself. So you're giving those kids those chance to actually begin that self love to receive love. I really believe that to receive and accept love, you have to love yourself. So yeah. what you're doing, you, you, you're saving lives essentially you're creating hope for these kids and also healthy relationships for their life going forward yeah. as well like mm -hmm. it's not just about those like few months or those few years that they're with you it's it's what goes on after and what who they impact in their in their future and how they raise their future children like it all will be shifted mm -hmm. based on the the tools that you're giving and providing to them well yeah i mean thank you i just you know that's definitely what we're doing at fostering care too at the our our trauma mm -hmm. healing intensive and trade school is uh getting these youth as they're aging out of foster care ages 18 to 21 so their brain is still forming mm -hmm. um and reprogramming healing their trauma but also um one of the things that i cherish about fostering care is that we're giving them healing modalities, not just ones that people do to you, like acupuncture, but we're also Kundalini yoga and Qigong, martial arts, a lot of other tools that they can use by themselves over time. Yes, they're also getting a teaching certificate. Then also David Elliott Breathwork, you can do on your own. I do it often on my own. Um, but they're also getting the teaching certificate from David Elliott Breathwork. And now we're working here in the States. They have something called peer to peer certification where people with lived experience get certified to work with others. Like oh, right. with other, one of the things we really are excited about is our graduates going back into the system to help heal youth yeah. as, as healing teachers healing, helping the youth to learn how to heal their own trauma in, who are still inside the system. I think that's the way to go is youth coming out of foster care, healing, having these trauma healing intensives, learning and, and getting certified in a healing trade, going back into the system and teaching to all the kids that are in this, the justice system, the foster care system, so that they're already, as they're already having cognitive reframing, they're already learning how to modulate and you know, control their behaviors, their thinking, their emotions, and become even more increasingly individuated and autonomous, but also have, uh, not just skills that they can work on with themselves, but literally have careers. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I also think it's awesome to have, I think that's the best way to go about it is to have people that were once in the fostering system to go back into it because there's nothing yeah. worse than like me. I was quite, I, I have ADHD, so I had a lot of emotional outbursts as a child and I mm. refused to talk to any psychologist or therapist that didn't I didn't feel that relation to if I felt like they didn't understand the irrational thoughts I was having then I wasn't going to give them the time of day 
Um, yes. And I think it's similar in foster care system. If someone's telling you how you should be acting, but they've never experienced yeah. your life or even close to it, then they're not, you're not going to connect. So I think that's an awesome thing. I've said awesome a mm. hundred times in this conversation. <laughs> I don't know what other word to use right now. Just well, it awesome. is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, you know, when I was in foster care and there was the psychology students that used to come for therapy, I used to mess with them so hard because I was like, oh, really? Oh, really? You really care about me? Yeah. Like, okay. And, you know, maybe they were an odd bird and they really just had a heart you know, as big as Texas and that, you know, they were the one therapist that really <laughs> cared about me. But again, yeah. to your point earlier, my parents didn't care about me. Yeah. So why would I think that some ran, but also they, I know, I know that they, they, you can tell by the questions they're asking. You can just tell by who they are that they have, you know, I can't even process my trauma. What are the odds? that you're going to be able to process my trauma. And there's nothing worse in those moments than, than blind pity mm. or even blind compassion. Let's just be kind and say, let's just call it compassion. When you have a, that much pain, there's nothing more insulting, I think, than blind compassion. It's like, no, you if you understand, then you understand. And it's true to your point. There's an instant knowing and I think it's for other things as well, but there's a, there's a, especially whether it's neurodivergence or whatever it is, there's an instant, by the way, um, love on the spectrum, which is from Such Australia, a good show. <laughs> one of my favorite shows in the history of television. Oh, um, same. I love it so much. <laughs> it's so beautiful and it's so important. And it, I think it just, for anyone that saw it, it changed the world. So it, it, it's such a beautiful, uh, like to, you know, to your point, like going into that world yeah. and I felt a very, very, you know, loving way as much yeah. as one can in, in, uh, real, whatever that's called reality TV. It was pretty, it was pretty open hearted. I felt, but, um, Yes, I think the I think the I I know from personal experience one of our great healers at our at fostering care is a woman named Mercedes Tiggs and she has something called H sixteen culinary therapy and Mercedes uh, also aged out of foster care and now works with trafficking survivors in San Diego and she and I met at a Thanksgiving dinner in Beverly Hills <laughs> and everyone was all like just doing their thing and I said something and then like. She said something back and everyone's all talking like, you know, normal, fancy, you know, concerned conversations. And I just looked at her and she looked at me and all of a sudden it was like we both sort of said at the same time, basically, I was in foster care. Wow. You Is just there- knew. You yeah. just know. You felt that connection. Yeah. Magnetic. Yeah. And it's true. It's like you don't need to talk about it when it's a shared experience. Yeah. That knowing. And to be already fair, know. I think that people are doing here in the States right now, really focusing. I just went to the Board of Supervisors meeting yesterday here for L.A. County, and it's incredible. Housing and mental health are the two main issues that are happening right now in politics. And there's and I went to the D.D. Hirsch um, event the other night. They're an incredible mental health organi- foundation, nonprofit organization. And they're, you know, changing laws and getting a, a in, in America right now, there is an, a, an onus on trying to focus on mental health. If it's yeah. true that mental health is at the, at the root of mm. homelessness and the overpacked prison in, in system and the overpacked foster care system and all of these things, well, then let's fix mental health. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's what and you the, hope that people would do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I do think it's true that there's just that, as they say, uh, the therapeutic value of lived experience. And so my point was, yeah, I think that this whole peer to peer and people with lived experience now becoming sort of inverting the power structure instead of these sympathetic, highly educated, I'm not going to say bourgeois, um, but, you know, people with, with affluence and um, access coming in with this sort of compassion 
but really maybe perhaps not being able to understand truly, uh, instead having the people who've survived coming back or who are surviving come come back into the system and heal it from the inside out. Because also too, foster care system is approximately in America about a trillion dollars a year industry. So wow. I don't know, I'm not an expert in this, but in my personal limited experience, a trillion dollars a year going into the uh, society, going into the economy, mm -hmm. generated for big pharma, all of the subsidiary financial pipelines that are create generated by these 500,000 kids. Um, I don't think you're going to fix it from the outside because mm -hmm. that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you start healing from the inside, I think that it'll just, it won't be able to contain the old system anymore. Mm -hmm. I know for me, like my trauma, that's what my truth was, is that I didn't, try to expand and make my life bigger i worked on the inner shadow work the you know working on releasing and creating a safe space for my trauma to to heal and to to move and to turn into to transform into life force and then what happened was and i actually experienced it many times over where i could tell that my physical structure couldn't contain the increase of vibration or the increase of energy that was being created as I released all that sort of subjugated, like the, the trauma that was like trapped inside of me, as it began to release and heal, I became more expansive and my body tried to keep it. I had a lot of yeah. physical pain because my body was like, this is difficult. I can't, expand fast well, enough to it's it's all it knows for a, a lot of years that's all you knew it's all your body knew to take so in. just hold it in for so long as well exactly but as survive. you release it you can get a lot of physical pain yeah wow. um, but then you know just there's a lot of work that can be done around that to release the physical pain but just knowing that it's just a process of expansion of personal expansion and i think that that usually in my life experience that whatever is true for me also in ways is true for others and i think that you could take that example and transfer it to the idea of the foster care system where is it if you start to heal the people the children inside the system and they start to become more healed and their their and their per, yeah. their autonomy increases and their self-esteem and their self-love and their self-awareness increases, then it will be impossible to hold those old systems. Just as yeah, my rib yeah. age had to in increase and had to relax and open up in order to make space for my expansion, so too will, I think, the foster care system. And since 80 to 90% of youth aging out of foster care end up in prison, commit suicide or homeless, then we're also working with all of those systems as well. The chances that someone, a child aging out of foster care who's healing their trauma is going to end up in prison are, are much slimmer than if you just go from foster care to homeless to prison. Mm, yeah. That's and so it's true. not, again, I just want to be super clear. My experience, I I wanted to go to prison at, in, in many ways because then I was safe. Mm -hmm. I had a a wall. I had walls around yeah. me. I had a bed and I had meals guaranteed every single day. There was no, there's no missing meals and there was no having to hustle for a safe place to sleep at night. So it's not, I don't know, like people who are so hard on, 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 you know, the criminal acts, I'm sure there are some really horrible people out there who are committing violent crimes and who are just mad as hatters and perhaps the prison system is the best place for them to protect society from them i also think that some people are habitual criminals because they like the safety of prison yeah you've really opened my perspective to that i i had never thought of it from that perspective but now i'm thinking about it i'm like that makes total 
total sense. Mm. It, it's the only place you're guaranteed to even have a guard that makes sure you are safe majority of the time. Mm. I loved Juvie Jail. I felt so safe there because I had guards everywhere. There was cameras everywhere. Yes. No one could. People were always watching. And if someone attacked me, then the, it was caught on camera. And there was someone there to actually break it up to for To action you. it as well, yeah, yeah, straight away. Where if you're in a foster, like in a fostering group in a house yeah. and someone attack you attacked each other, it's up to that person in charge, like that supervisor to basically take care of the situation. And they're not trained to take care of that situation. They're trained to just shelter children, Yeah, really. They call the cops. Yeah. Their job yeah. is to call the cops. Just to call the police. Yes. Wow. Oh, yeah. that's it's, My brain is really like... Yeah expanded i i wanted to say to you you touched on something earlier where you mentioned that you grew up with a lot of strength and you had to have that strength to be able to have left your family to begin with and to kind of even when before you entered the foster care system to essentially stand up for yourself in that situation you're in with your biological family i want to say like how proud i am of you for doing that and mainly because my best friend she's done the same thing it was a little bit later in her life like at 18 she finally stood up for about stood up towards the abuse she was experiencing in her life um and within her family and she was the kind of the first person in that situation to kind of break the 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 glass to some extent or break the rose-colored glasses and kind of stand up for what she deserves in her life and 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 kind of say things as how, how they are and make her life better I wanted to ask you after doing that and after going through the foster care system, because like you, you mentioned, you were holding everything in for such a long time. And then as you started to expand, what is it that actually flicked for you to start working on that trauma? Because I know now she's struggling a little bit with she wants to expand and then she's she wants to, to delve into that healing. But it's scary for her now, like in her late 20s, she's still feeling scared to relive what she may have experienced back then. Where was it for you? Like, do you remember a time in your life where you kind of clicked and you're like, you, I can't keep living this way. I need to start taking action. Or was it more of a gradual sort of thing? Sorry, that well, was a very long-winded question. <laughs> no, it's an amazing question. And, and, you know, I love, I'm happy for your friend that she's doing this at her age. And I'm happy for your friend that she's doing it at a time when I feel like there's so much more access. At the very least, YouTube. Yeah, you know, I think yeah. YouTube uh, has blown up in terms of, I mean, there's a wonderful healer in Australia, too, uh, named Melanie Tanya Evans. And she does, uh, she's a narcissistic abuse specialist. And she's amazing. And I think that um, while loves- not all abuse is narcissistic abuse, I think that her template is it in terms of boundary setting and in terms of perhaps not intentionally, but learning about your self value and not letting other people mess with you anymore is a really important part of the trauma healing process because you have to be safe in order to heal the trauma is my experience. My psyche needs to know that there's something about me that's got this and that I'm going to, my body won't give me any more than I can handle in terms of memories and it, it has an innate intelligence that will create situations where I'll find the right healer. I'll find, I'll be led to the right teacher. And that, and just learning that it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a life long process of healing trauma for your friend. It's such an amazing time right now. We have so much access to yeah. so many great thinkers and great healers. And so for me, yeah, just remembering that there's an intrinsic, magic and there's an intrinsic power to whatever the trauma was and somehow it's connected to my life's purpose this in my mind and my thinking this pre-agreed upon almost chosen path but i think that it's the healing the trauma in and of itself of course is is heinous and it's horrible and it's a human tragedy that we have any at all but i have come to notice in my 58 years that no one as my friend richie says gets out alive every single person has trauma every single person has something horrible perhaps it's secret perhaps they wear it on their sleeve but every single person in my limited life experience has something horrible that's unconscionable that happens to them so if we all have that in common perhaps 
it's part of our, our the magic of life. Perhaps healing that trauma is somehow connected to a greater, higher life's purpose. And so that um, when I started to think like that and I started to look at myself as though, what if I was doing everything right? What if there was an intrinsic intelligence to all of my life to the trauma to the parents that I chose you know and one example for me is that I came to realize and although it's not true anymore for my life because I've I have healed a lot of my relationships with some of my family members but I think that at the at, as a child I chose people that wouldn't love me as parents because I had things to do with my life that were that needed that my family members that experienced love as children my half siblings some of them in particular felt they grew up in a safe home environment and they were loved and appreciated and valued and cherished and they all live within a few miles of where they grew up and there's nothing wrong with that I love that. Of course, it's my fantasy, but my life's purpose was such that I needed to travel the world yeah. and I needed to become an actress and I needed to get a platform that I can now use in the pursuit of my life's purpose, which is opening this trauma healing intensive and starting to use my platform as a way to talk about the atrocities of foster care. I, I'm in awe of you right now. Are you, it's, it's amazing that you talk about life's greater purposes when something like that, that something that has happened to you your whole life could have easily led you down a different path where you, maybe you weren't, wouldn't have been here right now. But the fact that you've used it as like a superpower it's fuel yeah. basically to actually help other people going through the same thing. I, I, I got to say, Angela, you you are, you are like a superhero. You're like a real life superhero. And I am so, I've only known you for the past 50 minutes, but I've got to say, like, <laughs> I am so very proud of you. You are a wonderful, wonderful person. And I'm just so happy. And i got to tell you, you're inspiring me right now because like you said, everyone's had their own trauma. Like I, I don't have a relationship with my mom from because of emotional abuse reasons, but for me to look into those healing practices i just i you've inspired me tonight thank you i also I think i also wanted to say like i think i really really related to what you said around and i i actually have a similar belief like in my mind as well that not i i don't think i've articulated it to myself as like choosing this life but i've always felt like once i've decided that like okay i'm just gonna see you okay I've, I've experienced this trauma i've experienced mental health issues i've experienced all these things and let me just see where they lead let me just see if i delve into them where they take me mm. instead of running away from them to some extent I've, I've been someone that has from a very young age delved into the trauma rather than away from it um which mm. is what led me to becoming a mindset coach which is what led me to doing this podcast, podcast. um and I, I can really attest to what you said in terms of like, that's exactly what I've done with my life. I, I started a way of like working in corporate world and learning how to make businesses work and doing social media for other businesses, all to lead me to the space of being able to do that for myself so that I can mm. pr make a platform where I can share and allow other young girls that experience the same kind of feelings as I did as growing up to, or to essentially feel like they're not alone, but at the same time, my end goal is to essentially help families that are broken to kind of learn how to communicate with each other because that mm. was the situation I had. So, and I, I truly believe that if it wasn't for those traumas that happened in my life, I would hundred yeah. percent not be on the path and journey I am on right now. And I wouldn't want to be on any other journey right mm. now. Um, and I can mm. attest the same to you. Like we're on this podcast together and yes, you've gone through your traumas with your mum, but you being a motherless mum right now and, and your own, like you're helping other mums out there to show their children the love that you maybe didn't get, like receive in your thing. And it's, it's still sort of the same alignment. No, I, I agree. I'm definitely learning the lessons that my mum taught me essentially. And I'm 
using it with my child because I've got a nearly three-year-old and every day I consciously think about how I could fix the wrongs that I've had with my life with my child. So you're so right with the way you articulated that. So my, my, I'll tell you the, the truth, just to answer that question in another way too, I was, gosh, how old was I? I was almost 40. I was in my late thirties and I had been, you know, technically incredibly successful. Um, and I had, you know, all the outside stuff. I had the big house and Beverly Hills and the cars and the stuff and the money and the closets full of clothes and da, 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 and the bank account filled with money and a couple of, uh, uh unfortunate things happened at work, uh, with people that I was working with and I became, you know, um, I was re-traumatized and I had no personal infrastructure to sustain myself uh, while I was going through that trauma. I, I had no, I had no, uh, no family and I just did, I couldn't take care of myself and experience that traumatization um, by myself. And so I just shut down everything. Basically, I basically just threw away all my money. I got rid of everything. I became homeless. I got rid of everything and went back to ground zero because that's what was safe for me. But it was in and I started doing drugs again, which I hadn't done in, you know, over nine years. And in that sort of blurry, almost homeless, throwing away my money, drinking haze, there was a moment where I heard a voice. I woke up in like woke up in the middle of the night, but I was, you know, coming in and out. Uh, it had been a partying night and I heard a voice say, who are you? And I was like, I'm, I'm Angela. And it was like, no, who are you? And I was like, I'm angry. And it said, why are you angry? And I said, and I had to think about it. And I was like trying to think I was trying to, cause I was a little bit out of it. And I was like, why am I angry? Why am I angry? Why am I angry? And all of a sudden I went, my mother, I'm angry because of my mother. And I'm so proud of myself because that's such a great justification. And it's, I heard the voice say, if you're, if you have to think about it that long, it's time to let it go. And then I, I went back to sleep and I got up a couple of hours later and I had this weird energy inside of me that said, I refuse to believe that I drew some proverbial short straw when I was born and I don't get love in this lifetime. If I can be five foot five and on the cover of Vogue, if I can be have a GED and write for Time magazine, if I can and sell TV shows like where people are graduating from Yale that don't have that opportunity. And um, it was like, I refuse to believe that I can't get love. And at that moment, I was like, I'm going to get love. And it, as Melanie Tanya Evans refers to it, which I think is a, appropriate for all forms of healing, the, it, it, with, he, with trauma healing, you know, it becomes quantum. It, it gets exponential. It's like it's not A, B, C, D, E, F. It's like A. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden there's B, C, D, E, E, F, G. Yeah. And, in, and it's all happening at once. And then while those things are happening and you're addressing all of these, you know, per- subsidiary things from the trauma, uh, then all of a sudden there's another layer that's already working. And like, I'll just be walking down the street and I'll have healings. I'll have like, my brain will be like, the reason why you do that is because of this. And <laughs> I do that all the time. And you know, let's, let's forgive that person. So then I forgive that person. And then all of a sudden this gets fixed. So it's just, you know, it's profound and it's a beautiful, magical, mystical journey. There's great religions throughout the history of time that have focused on this, whether it's Sufism or Kabbalism. There's, there's, you know, great ancient, important traditions predicated on important law, um, spiritual and religious laws. It's, it's, it's true. Our, I think our, we were made as human beings to have this exponential healing process. And so that was sort of... What happened was not long after that, I still continued to go down, but then out of the, 
I started to have very strange dreams that were prim, prim, like premonitionary. Is that the word? I had a very, a very strange dream. And I was like, I think something important is going to happen with my life. So then I got sober again. And then I started to like, I was led to this one healer who then led me to another healer who led me to a trauma rehab, who led me to a great teacher who one of my teachers is this guy, Rabbi Mordecai Finley, who has a wonderful course called Parenting the Soul of the Child. And technically, it's for parents, but I used it not consciously, but as, as I was listening I and I was in the place that I was at in my life, I started to use that compassion and that listening for my voice mm. i started to parent my words that i never would have said before inner child yeah i started like, me the, the the little me that wasn't parented well i began and i i know that it's true for for parents sometimes that uh, for some people my journey was that i healed my inner child mm. with that with that type of thinking but i know it's also true uh, for parents that you end up healing your trauma, your generational trauma yeah. with your children. It's yeah. like somehow it becomes this, yeah. again, this karmic quantum bubble where as they, as you lovingly parent them and they reflect back to you that you it, see yourself it, it kind of in a new you. way. Exactly. Yeah. And like you said too, then you begin healing the world because you're not just creating this you're creating a, like a like a trauma healing uh expansive bubble that yeah. changes the world exactly. i mean also too just in the very simplest of terms i had an experience when i changed the way that i pray uh where i only began for a while using the idea of um rabbi heschel that god needs to be praised regardless of whatever god means to you individually i changed I changed the way I pray from God help me to thank you, God, you are beautiful and powerful and expansive and merciful and caring. And what happened was I started to feel as I praised God, my person, my, the God in me began to become bigger. And I realized that when I am in alignment with my life's purpose. And I am in, in, increasing the vibration of the divine by living my life's purpose and and dedicating my life uh to the pursuit of expansion of love in the universe then what happens is the i'm not only increasing the vibration of the divine but i'm also increasing the vibration of the divine in me so we're we're really and also the divine in everyone mm. right so we are really in the simplest of terms, increasing the love in the world when we are loving and healing. Couldn't agree more. I think yeah. there's a lot to be said about like once you start going like going into that journey of that self healing and and loving yourself and creating that connection to that higher power, it it's only natural for it to kind of like melt off to the person the people around you yeah. and it does that domino effect it, like you start spending time with someone else that's into that you're going to eventually realize yeah, the benefits of that it you. rubs off on the people around yeah. you i noticed a big thing when i first started to to get into like healing my trauma and working on myself i noticed that a lot of the issues i had with my family members and the the situations that i could just could not deal with I noticed what while I was working on myself, even though my family weren't working on themselves per se, that it was rubbing off on them and my interactions with them were so much lighter and so much nicer because they were seeing like they were happy to interact with me because I was coming from it from such a loving position that they then were more open minded to what I would I actually had to say as well. So it, it, it's always beneficial. I, I love I love everything so you said. <laughs> And so much of this is like, just put down your end of the skipping rope and there's no tug of war. Yes. There's no tug of war if you just let go. And also I do think too, like, especially with difficult personalities, you know, there's this idea that that loving is being like super kind. Mm -hmm. Well, loving is also uh, setting boundaries. Yes. If someone's oh God, out of yeah. their mind, if someone is sick, if someone is like, act, you know, not well, then saying, 
no, thank you. I just yeah. don't. I just, I, you know, let, let's yeah. keep this call to five minutes. Or, you know what, I'll come and see you every January for three yeah. days. Or, you know, I'm sorry, I just don't really have time right now. Like, mm. all, setting boundaries for ourselves helps other people who are um, not uh, contained mm. to, like, well, we, all of a sudden, if you're coming with giving, 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 they're just going to take, take, take. take, take, take. But if with you know i'm not super comfortable with your behavior anymore so i'm gonna just take some time and some space from you that can be an jarring enough to shake someone out of the spell and make realize wait everyone's leaving me why or even just being very direct and confrontational if that is what needs to be but i i also think it's it's very true that um you know people that love us respect our boundaries and it took me a very long time to be able to be in a place where to say it's not worth it to me mm. to be have people in my life who don't respect my boundaries. Yeah, because I work. That's another thing too. Is it we're, it's skill sets we're developing, right? I, these I was are, just about to say that it's a hard muscles. skill to learn. Yeah, the things it that is. should be taught and, and when you building boundaries like, should be taught in school. If you go to to Harvard and get a doctorate in something you're not gonna work at wendy's for three dollars an hour you're like no i have this and so my experience has also been that the more I, i've dedicated a lot of time money and effort to healing my trauma so i am much less interested in having people in my life who don't value and respect me yeah and it, it it's just a natural progression of of self value i also think it's one of the hardest things to do in the world setting the boundaries and actually for, for in my experience i found that that was something that took me such a long time to actually do like and that and that's working with a therapist and trying to build up the courage to actually say you know what i i think it's time that we separate like i you know i'm i want you to live your life and me live mine not necessarily on the same path. It took me years to actually learn that. It's one of the hardest things I've done. I also, I just want to say, yes, I hear you. Yeah. And I, and I completely relate to that. Yeah. And I also think that one of the tricky things about that for me was realizing that I was the one that I needed to set boundaries with. Yeah. And that what happened was I practiced on myself. Like I would say, oh, tomorrow I really want to get up and go for a hike because that's good for my mental health and it grounds me and that's where I can dream and think. And it also, I'm, you know, I'm an Aries. I need to be, I need to be physical, right? Yeah. Mm. And then the next day I'd be too tired or I, mm. I would differently prioritize my day based on someone wanted to talk to me or there was something else that seemed more you know, important to me at the moment. And so, well, then I just lied to myself and I wouldn't address it. It's like, stop, you know, stop complaining, just move on, like get over it. And instead of like that, if someone else talked to me like that, I would be like, just get over it. Like, yeah. Who do you think you're the hell? But with me, I would be like, stop complaining, just get over it. And then I would be like, okay, no, I don't do that anymore. Now I go, what's going on? Oh, well, you said we were going to go hiking today and then you didn't go. All right. Can you go hiking now? Is it too late? Is it possible that you could just stop everything and go for that hike? It doesn't have to be for an hour and a half. It can be for half an hour. And you start to negotiate with myself. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be like, okay, yes or no. And if the answer is no, I go, okay, I'll tell you what. What is it you actually need right now? I need to finish this project. Okay, tell you what, let's sit down right now, no distractions, finish the project. And then tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, I'd like you to go for that hike. And then I do it no matter what. And I've proven to myself that I am trustworthy. Yes. I've proven to myself that I value what I say. And by, you know, and on and on and on. And so then therefore, when someone else, because I, I couldn't, I did not come from a place where I was, where I had a voice. I did not come from a place where I had physical autonomy. I did not come from a place where I was taught these skills. So 
I've I had to I didn't know people would say things like you deserve better than that person or you deserve better than this. And I was like, who are you talking to right now? Like, you don't even know me. Like, you'd have to know my whole life to tell me whether I deserve blank or not, because you think you deserve or you don't deserve. It has nothing to do with me, kind of like to your point earlier. Mm -hmm. So what I had to do was the, the you know, they, it's a saying, but it's true. It's like the longest journey is from the mind to the heart. I had to go into who is Angie? What is Angie like? What are Angie's individual and unique things? Because I couldn't, man, I don't know about you guys, but comparing myself to everybody else didn't work for me because I didn't yeah. like everybody else. I didn't want what other people have. I didn't want the two cars and the thing in the house yeah. and the thing that, that meant nothing to me. But what do I want? You know, and like to your saying earlier, like safety, I want to be loved and appreciated. But, you know, it is also true. I found that the more I get to know myself, and what my needs are and what my desires are and what would make me happy. Like, for example, like some people always used to say, you should, you know, get married and and then, you know, so you sort of have like some income security and you have like all of those things, right? Well, for me, my unique fantasy my whole life was I wanted what I didn't have as a teenager, which was to start a life with someone else. Like I didn't want someone who was already super successful um, or someone who had no life goals. I wanted someone who was a hard worker and who was really ambitious, but who I could help them build their career. And with each passing year, I used to think, boy, that'll never happen because no one is going to be 50 and starting their life over. Well, guess what? I found someone last year who's 50 and who has let his whole business life go in the pursuit of his dreams. And he's wow. starting from scratch. So guess what? My dream came true. But if you put that on a bulletin board at a mall, I don't know that a lot of people would have picked that. Mm. Signed up for that, yeah. But, but I, I would. But I picked it. And that's something that I had to admit because it, for for my whole life, people would project onto me like there was something wrong with me because I wasn't basically marrying for you know income security and i didn't want it but it wasn't until my dream came i admitted what my dream was and was like okay i'm okay with that that doesn't sound like a bad dream i like that dream i'm kind of proud of you for having that dream it makes sense that that's your dream because i would never let anyone take care of me financially but i also didn't want someone that i was taking care of financially yeah. so it was a weird thing it had to be really it was unique and it was individual and I had to let go of all outside ideas of what that how stupid that may or may not be the and my point is that when you know what it is you want it's a lot easier to feel grateful and happy about what you get I'm so happy I know, for I you love, that you found that person I love you so much oh my that God. is so amazing so that makes me so you. happy it really is like once you've put it out to the world and you actually take the time to ask yourself those questions as to like, what is it that I want? What is it that I value oh, aside from the noise of the world and society? Like what is actually my core true desire right now? And you put it out into the world. It will find its way to you. It, it, the world is just waiting for you to say it out loud almost. Mm, to just believe yeah, it. It's just, yeah, to believe that yeah. you're actually able to accept and receive mm. it as well. Yeah, and also it's not like there's going to be a lot of competition for it if it's your truly unique Oh, my God, thing. that's so right. It's not going to be the status quo. Maybe it is, but it might not be. And it's and like that, you know, all of that individualism, like it's okay to, you know, like I love leftovers. I love leftovers. Yeah. I don't know why, but I love leftovers. Well, my partner loves leftovers. And I was in, this is like going to sound silly, but I was in uh, a, a significant, two significant relationships in my life prior to this one where they, my partners didn't like leftovers and they thought it was like, so like kind of cheap and poor white trash to have leftovers. And that's something that I val that food, value, valuing food 
cooking at home, making delicious meals and having eating leftovers for a couple of days, making your own pickles, cooking your own food. Those are things that uh, from my childhood that I really connect to and that my mother was, um, you know, uh, always like no sugar, no processed foods, only organic foods. Da, da, da. So that's something that is a good thing about my childhood that I deeply cherish that isn't something that's a common value in Los Angeles, California, for example, but it's a uniquely me thing. And, you know, it's like we want other people is, you know, in a broader sense, when I extrapolate, I would say we we want other people to value our idiosyncrasies, right? We want, I, I've always wanted, like, can't someone just love me for the way I am? Like, you know, I'm weird. <laughs> I like these weird things. And then these are things that I like. I like hand-me-downs. And I like, I mean, almost all my clothes are are, give, are gifts. So they're either hand-me-downs or my friends made them and they gave them to me. And that's something from my childhood also that now I value. I don't wear makeup, in, you know, except for like on a red carpet for the most part. Because I, growing up, I didn't wear makeup. There's some things that felt horrible about my childhood that I now realize are what make me unique. And I, yeah. you know... These, these, these things. And so my point is like, I want other people to value those things about me, but I didn't value them about myself. So it's like when I start to kind of go, look, these are the things I'm looking for in, in a relationship. These are the things that I'm looking for in my life. And I won't compromise on them, whether it's hand-me-downs or homemade food or leftovers or uh, working hard together as a as a unit yeah. to make your dreams happen because i can make my dreams happen by myself i've done it time and time again yeah. i want a partnership that where we make it becomes expansive and we're making each other's dreams come true together in unison and like those are those are uniquely me things perhaps i'm they're shared but they're definitely things that i was ashamed of there's mm-hmm. definitely things that i felt that that encouraged my self-loathing and my separateness that now I value and I cherish not because someone else thinks that they're cool because they really don't <laughs> it's because <laughs> it's because I now no longer care how you perceive me but I'll tell you I can't experience the sh- the feeling of that shared experience with another person who has the same value system as I do, if I didn't honor those things myself. I'm just sitting yeah. here. I, I literally just, <laughs> you just, I mean, I'm still in awe. Like yeah, I know. everything you've said has just really, really taken me away. Like my breath is stunned yeah. right now. I just think the, the self-actualization that you have done is incredibly inspiring and I feel like not very common based on people that I've come across whether they're in their later years or my age or younger I feel like it's not common for people to know themselves that well it's part of my destiny it's something I was born with I always I've always had it I'm I'm a little bit of a funny bird that way when I was three years old I I I had an experience where I was, you know, now I'd been separated from my mother for over a year. Uh, I didn't see her for another four years. And I, uh, I was basically kind of alone and about to be shuffled off to uh, other relatives. And I was in a snowbank and I looked up into the sky and I just had this funny feeling. And I said, I can do it. Like I knew my life was going to be a challenge, but I sort of accepted my mission basically and there's been suicidal ideations throughout my life there's been that sort of subversive suicide like with drugs and alcohol or self-hatred and self-loathing there's been a lot of self-abandonment but I have always had a, a strange connection uh, to something bigger than me and I've also had a strange connection to my destiny while I'm not always known past the next turn, I, I've i just sort of known that there's things I have to do and that I have to stay on task. And even though people were trying to pull me off, like, come here, live there, marry me, do this, have kids, da, da, da. it was like, no, this is what I have to do. So I do think that it's um, 
thank you for saying that and for acknowledging it and for honoring that in me and 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 I and you both. And I also it, it is something that I was just born with because this path of individuation yeah. um, is is part of my destiny, of right? Course, it's like exactly taking this healing path that I was led on and now replicating the paradigm for others. So of course I would have had to have that. Exactly. Most definitely the fact that you were three years old, like that, I find that so unbelievably tragic in a sense that as a three-year-old, you were able to process that, that that's what your life was going to be. And you knew at that age that, okay, this might be a tough road for me. It makes me unbelievably sad because I have a three-year-old and Mm -hmm. To think that if he ever thought that way about himself, like as a parent, that actually breaks me into a million pieces. So I, I'm really, uh, mm, I'm sorry that you had to experience that at such a young age, but at the same breath, it has led you to save the lives that you are saving now. So it really was just meant to be with you. Like I, I've, I don't know if I've witnessed something that's actually been so profound and so just obvious. Mm. If that makes yeah. sense. It, it, thank you. Yes, 100%. And also, too, like, I just want to put a shout out for all the dark nights. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. The valley, yeah. Of, it was called like the valley of the shadow of death. Like, yeah. that's the thing is it, it was, there was many times I was in the shadow, in the darkness, and just, absolutely terrified um but i just kept going you just kept going you know and then now the shadow is my friend but at that time the shadow was not my friend the shadow was sort of something that was pulling me into itself but now i've been able to become like you were saying earlier like i go into those places now it's like if, if i'm disturbed it's like okay let's go in now that i'm not see i was in the shadow and that's i, I think you know a, a deeper way of looking at that like people who've been through stuff mm. are are better teachers at it perhaps because once you're not so much of life is avoiding the pain right so much of life is avoiding looking at the dark secrets and sometimes the dark secrets is i had a part in that i had a part in that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to look at that, uh, you know, that was like, no, not me. No, no, no. Let's keep going. Let's just, you know, don't look back. Um, but once I was like, all right, well, they seem to be really upsetting me. Uh, is there anything I've done in this? And and I had a very powerful healing with a wonderful member of my family where all I did was I was mad at them for what they did when I was a child. And I was, when I say mad, I mean, Hell hath no fury. (laughs) (laughs) I would never forgive, not in this lifetime. And I hope they suffer in the next one too. Yeah. Um, Ad infinitum. But what happened was I started to see that some of my misery in my current life was based on that relationship that I wouldn't heal. And what happened was all I did was I said, all right, I might have a part in this the only thing because i was innocent and i was a child and did but i could say it's within the realm of possibility that they did the crime when i was a kid metaphorically speaking but i've held them in contempt Mm -hmm. my whole life and they had been trying to to get back in touch with me and to sort of heal thing but i could tell they weren't really they didn't want it they wanted it to go away they wanted the pain to go away they didn't mine and theirs. They didn't actually want to be held accountable for their yeah, behavior. Yeah. And so I was very angry and I was like, you know, no, no, no. And and I was very punitive of them. And so I, when I had this moment where I was like, okay, it's within the realm of possibility that my part is they did the crime and I've held them in contempt every day since then. Mm-hmm. And I am willing to look at that, I'm willing to admit that I may have hurt them with my contempt. And I did nothing more than that. All I did was just think, okay, that could be my part. 
Mm-hmm. And the next time, as, as of course, as fate would have it, within a week, they I was asked to go to where they are across, wow. you know, four like a full day of flying. I went to where they were because of another family member's wedding. Like it, had not, it wasn't direct for them. They picked me up at the airport and almost instantly they started to cry. And they said, I wasn't very a very good person when you were young and da, 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 da. And I put my hand on their face because I was already prepared for it. And I said, I understand and I love you. And then that was it. And our lives have been profoundly changed since that moment. All I did was put down the end of the rope and just say, okay, I'm going to stop hating you for what you did. And, And then I just watched the show of healing transformation. And by the way, just for anyone listening who's interested in this kind of stuff, within two years, something happened in our dynamic where suddenly I understood that they loved me. Suddenly I understood that I was loved by them. And suddenly I understood that I was ready to have a healthy, happy, loving relationship romantically. It was all of that stuff that was so corrupted and that I I would not unfreeze for a second because that was my story that as soon as that healed it took a little bit of time and then suddenly I felt a shift in me that I'd never had in my life where I was like I'm ready to be loved because I am I feel like crying because like especially when you said because that was my story because I feel like it is so easy to hold on to that, to hold on to like, that's my, my, my beginnings. Like that's what, I, who I am is my stories that that's all I have sometimes. And it's hard to let go of that and to let go of that narrative when you're in the process of healing, because then you're left to your own devices and you actually have to do like, you have to start allowing yourself to just be free of that story and not let it kind of hold you back in other areas. I, I think that was so powerful what you just said. So, so powerful. Angela, we'll ask you one more question. That way you can go ahead with your Yeah, we've taken up so much of your time. I was thinking about boundary setting. I'm like, oh my God, we've taken up so much more time than we thought because we've just been so engaged in your conversation. I'm having a great time. Oh, thank Thank you so so much. I love you guys a lot. It's, you know what it's like. It's just wonderful to be seen, met and heard. Yeah, well, I I feel like time has flown. No, thank you, you yeah. so much and also I wanted to say as well like I appreciate what you the, what you shared um for my friend as well she's a massive fan of yours as well when I told her I was interviewing you you she like <laughs> lost, her lost it lost her mind <laughs> um so and I think that she'll get so much out of yeah, listening to this because oh just amazing but yeah. um the final question yeah, we'll go through the final <laughs> question because oh my god and uh, we can talk about music now which I is know, exciting I know. <laughs> the final question that we have is and, and we really love this question because it's more of a window to the soul and, you know, three songs that you have a personal connection to. And why? And why? <laughs> well, it's funny because I love the title of your show. I love Daydream Believer. Um, it's the monkey. Right? Yes, yes, correct. correct. Yes, correct. thank you. We tell people all the time, like people that are our parents' age and they don't know what we're talking about. We're like, how do we know who the monkeys are, but you don't know who the monkeys I know. are? Like, surely. Uh, well, cheer up, sleepy Jean. Oh, what can it mean to a daydream believer and a homecoming queen? I mean, of, <laughs> I mean, of course. Like, that song was written. I feel like when if you love that song, you feel like it was written for you. Oh, yes. so I do. My God, and we've said that. that so many times too. My God, like it's us. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. I, I agree. Uh, it is us. And um, so that was an inadvertent one. Um, you know, I I was telling you guys earlier. There's a lot of. I'm from Nova Scotia originally, and some of my family still live there, and there's a lot of fires there right now. And Nova Scotia is a really tiny peninsula, and so it wouldn't take much for it to completely burn to, 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 to the ground. And yeah. and it, the wildfires there are out of control and have been for a while now. And apparently, I just saw this morning that the smoke from the fires has gone down so far as it's completely engulfed New York City even. That's so it's crazy. quite a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, so amazing. I wanted to, uh, my, I'm going to pick um, my my number one karaoke song, which is Snowbird by Anne Murray. Oh, um, oh. 
it's my Anne Marie's from Nova Scotia, and she's related to our family through marriage. And oh. uh, it's my it makes me laugh that like I'm in LA and I'm with a whole bunch of like super cool kids, and everyone's doing karaoke, and they're all really cool, and I'm like. <laughs> Things and fly away. Then <laughs> take the step you like it. Just I love the irony yeah. <laughs> of like such a sweet little country do 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 like song <laughs> um, makes me laugh. So I love that song, and you know I cannot go far. I've actually written. Uh, I proposed there's a there's a wonderful book company called uh, 33 and a third and they have this incredible collection of short hardcover books that are all about music and albums so if you guys would actually really Ooh, like oh them, yeah and you can you know you you pitch them a, a book uh, about a song or an album and then you get to publish it and I didn't oh. get I didn't get that but I did submit and it was for the wall because when I was in foster care, I was in a group home on the north side of town in Winnipeg and it was the worst group home of the group homes that I was in. And it was really hellacious. It was really unconscionable what I saw. It sounds like stories about, did you see the show Oz? Like it was like, you know, it was really bad. And, but there was a little room downstairs that had a, pool table and a record player and no one was ever in there they were all upstairs fighting and fucking um excuse my language and uh they had it had they had that and a copy of this makes my hand look blurry um, <laughs> yeah. they, they had a copy of uh the wall and yeah. when i heard that album and i think in particular comfortably numb little angie featherstone 16 and a half years old in this group home felt like I was connected to something out a uh, bigger than here, bigger than Winnipeg, bigger than Manitoba, bigger than Canada, that there was people out there. If I could just get there, they would understand me and that I wasn't so alone. And just a little point of interest within two years, right? I came from abject poverty. I was, I am five foot five and three quarters, and I never dieted a day in my life. I was chubby and like, you know, healthy. Yeah. They called me for a model. But somehow that person in that room, in that group home in the north end of Winnipeg, ended up in London at a photo studio getting shot for a magazine, and the producer of the wall came in was looking for studio spaces and he said he goes uh, he's like we, we ended up all talking they were all looking at space we were shooting for this magazine and he said his name was Bob Ezrin and I said you're Bob Ezrin I said oh my god the wall saved my life and he said well I'm here recording but you like to come by and watch Dave Gilmore lay down guitar tracks what the hell Can you fucking believe that you oh my god what the fuck yeah, life is I know. life is written for us, my friends. Oh my god! Holy yes. shit! Oh my god! That is fantastic. And then, we'll talk about yesterday. <laughs> everything, everything, everything. I'll just say this because this is an important lesson too. I think the other one, you know, everything Prince ever wrote. But when I was in Winnipeg, we always would hear about him because it was really close to Minneapolis. So even when he was just in the early, early days, just starting out in the clubs, I would hear about him and I would hear his music. And I I decided that that I wanted to marry Prince because he sounded really super cool and I loved his music. But I wanted to, you know, I wanted to marry him. I didn't want to be like a groupie or a yeah. girl. He just slept. I wanted to be a partner, right? And so from that helped me pursue my dreams. That That seemingly difficult task became the thing that got me up and got me out of Winnipeg, got me on the Greyhound bus, got me showing up for the modeling interviews, got me traveling across the world to different countries all by myself with a knapsack and a, like, that was it, just me and living hand to mouth, like, having no money at all to survive. But I just kept pursuing my dreams because I wanted to, you know, I, and, and I wanted to, I created dreams for 
for myself that were sounded very difficult, almost impossible, so that I never gave up. And and uh, it, I, I ended up having tons of opportunities to meet him backstage passes and whatnot. And I didn't because I didn't want to meet that uh, idol. I didn't want that dream yeah. to end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sadly, you know, he passed away. But uh, what's interesting is one of the other things I love is biographies. And I read uh, Ted Turner's biography called It Ain't As Easy As It Looks, which is also good for this kind of stuff. But he talked in there about his father who committed suicide. And before his father died, he said to, to Ted Turner, never set goals for yourself that you can achieve in this lifetime. And I think that that sort of was, per was you know, is pertinent yeah. here. Wow. Like, I, I created this, you know, very difficult goal so that I always had something to strive for. I definitely get that. I also love it's coincidental it's Prince's birthday today. Levi, I know. 7th of of June. Wow. He's got the same birthday as my dog. So yeah. I was there and oh I always think God. I always play my dog Prince How music every like I was dancing with him earlier because it was the 7th of June like just a couple of hours ago for How us. Funny is and that? I was literally dancing with my dog to Little Red Corvette <laughs> before. Shut up. Yeah. I, that's you know I had a dog and I named him Prince. I had a husky once who I called Prince. <laughs> my, my, dog's name is, my dog's name is Presley Prince. <laughs> I call him. Yeah. How that's so cool. Oh my god! Birds of a feather, lady. Ah, oh, that is wow. amazing. That is so amazing. The only <laughs> book I've ever read is his um, ex-wife's Mate Garcia's biography about him. And that's the only. How is it? It was really good. It was really nice. It was very sad listening to like their, like why they had to split and stuff. Yeah. Um, obviously with the birth like of their child, like their child that didn't make it. But mm. overall, was I as someone that struggles to read because of my ADHD, it was something that could keep me consistent, yeah. which was good. So it was very nice. good in my opinion. And as someone that also loves Prince. <laughs> And it loves the idea of like <laughs> meeting someone and marrying them. <laughs> did you read it or did you listen to it? I read it back then, but now I, I've gone onto the audio books, but I have to listen to everything in 1.8 times speed because my brain doesn't process things that are slow, unfortunately. <laughs> I understand that. I find the the 1.0 on Audible not, no. not sustainable. Not at all. My yeah, not at all. And I've tried recently get to get back to reading books because I think um, there's something about whether you're reading left to right or right to left. There's something about that that I think is important for me for, yeah. for moving my eyes back and forth while I'm processing yeah. information, possibly releasing old information. And uh, it's like, it, I just think it might be really good for my brain, but I also, um, I just think it's, calming and i need that so i've just started again to force myself to actually read books because i like audible too because i can it, it i have this idea that reading a book takes too much time whereas yes. audible yeah. you can do it while you can do it as, as you do yeah. god forbid i spent two hours reading reading yes. we'll let you go because we know we've taken up so much of your time Quickly, though, before we let you go, what was it like working with Adam Sandler? Because I actually just can't <laughs> not, like, what was Wedding Singer like? Yeah. You can give us, like, a two second. <laughs> well, I love him. Yeah. He's wonderful. I love him. I love him. And one of the things I love about him was he's easygoing and he's kind and he's generous. And that's just when we were working together over the decades. You know, Adam has a very, I mean, he has a wonderful wife, Jackie. And he has a, uh, so I'm not surprised that his life is rich and full yeah. because he has that coming to him. Um, and I'll tell you something about him is Adam just has this incredible ability to make it like we're all a part of a, of a team. We're all a part of a community. Decades later, when I see him, he it's as though I saw him a few days before. I have no wow. part of his, I don't run into him, you know, every couple of years at something and He's just like, Featherstone, how's it going? Oh, my gosh. Like, he is just like a dear high school friend. We did one movie together in 1998, and you would think we went, you know, our families lived next to each other growing up or something. He is, uh, 
really special guy. That's awesome. That makes and not, so it's not just yeah. one movie. It was one of the most influential movies I know. of there's this not, lifetime. I don't think there's actually a time where I don't see my brothers and we don't say to each other at one point, hey, Linda, you're a bitch. Like, I don't think <laughs> I love that one too. That I'll is, be honest with you. The, I, the face change that you make in that yeah, scene is like Mwah, French kiss. It's actually yeah, yeah. amazing. Uh, to say French kiss instead of chef's kiss. Fucking hell. It's okay, it's nearly three oh, in the morning. It's a French, it's a French kiss. Uh, is that what it's yeah. called? I'm going to stop. Chef's kiss, French kiss. Nice. All the kisses. Like, That's what it is. Like yeah, we'll go with French. French, French kiss. Um, we're changing it. It's, it's, it's now, now French kiss. It yeah, it sounds I better. Agree. I agree. I agree. But no. that's how much. That's um, how perfect it was. <laughs> My God. Well, thank you. Yeah, I love. I love it too. I, and I often will be hiking, and if I'm thinking about something, and I'll be like, "Yeah, they did this. They did that." And I'll hear in my head, like, "Hey, Linda, you a bitch. You a bitch." <laughs> Love I love it. that. I love that. Oh, oh holy moly. Oh. Okay. Uh, we'll let you go with that. Oh, my oh, God. That's a perfect right. way to end the episode. Angela, thank, thank you so much for joining us and for this. Uh, I think you guys are great. I wish you guys everything, you know, thank all you. the best. And, and us to you, uh, it would – I would love to absolutely meet you one day in person. That would be, that would just make my life. And I hope that great. it's in the stars that we get to do that one day. Me too. Me too. Hey, great. To be continued to then. Be continued. I think so. To be continued. Okay. Well, thank, right. you so thank, much. You. thank you so much. Sorry we've kept you for so long and enjoy your rest of your day. Thank you. I will. You guys Bye. Too. Bye. And have a good sleep. Oh, thanks. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. It's a dream yeah, 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 yeah. come true. Dreams come true full circle moments in life honestly that felt like a dream an actual pinch me moment and i've said that a lot of times but this was an actual pinch me moment i really it's some you know there's things in life where you just don't believe that you'd ever get the opportunity to talk to someone that you have thought or known about your whole life yeah and you've just been like oh like i've watched you on tv my whole entire life and now I get to sit right in front of you and have a conversation with you and we relate about things that not many people can relate to Yes, with each other. Yeah. Even if it's not the exact same situation, you just kind of get... You kind of just understand you just get each, each other. other in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it's really bizarre. All I want to say, I was so into everything that she was saying and I was so excited to be able to... that I was looking at her face and listening to her voice that my feet were swinging like oh, the entire I time. I like was my so feet were like... Pew, 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 like like I was a child who couldn't hit the floor. Yes. You know what I mean? I like, know they're that's like how excited like, I was. Yes. Yeah. And she was just all the things that she said, the things that she's doing, her healing school. Oh my God. She's changing the world. Yeah. I she's helping these kids have a life. Yeah. Where so many of these kids end up on the street or in jail, but she's giving them opportunities yeah. and meaning and independence yeah it's a big thing especially that independence and that that deeper knowing of who they are and understanding what their values and and what their beliefs are so that they can go into a world that might not understand them but they can go into it knowing that they understand themselves exactly and i feel like that is truly a key in this world is like being able to understand yourself and to give yourself that love instead of looking for the world to give it to you because when we're constantly looking out into the world to to give us that love we're going to make choices and do things based on on trying to constantly reach for that. It's really heartbreaking to think that there's people out there that just don't don't want to do the small things to help those situations. And there's people like Angela out there that have lived through it and have done so much in their own career and still want to have a deeper purpose and a, a more true purpose to make that a reality for mm. any other person that they touch in their life. And and it just blows me away. And another thing that amazes me about her is the fact that she could have easily ended up as a statistic. Yeah. And have been that 80, 90% of foster care kids that age out in in jail or in um, homeless or possibly not with us anymore. Yeah. She could have easily been that statistic, but she made a career for herself. And even after that career happened and she had everything at that point, she still spiraled and made it out on the other side. Yeah. She had 
that true path of self-discovery and she fucking made it like she's she's leading the way she's leading the way to healing trauma yeah and healing yourself your childhood trauma and childhood trauma like even from my own experience my own experiences that's the hardest shit i've ever had to go through trying to be okay with my past sometimes you know yeah trying to rem- and then each day you because when we're so young you forget the shit that you did and yeah. the shit that you, that you went through and yeah as you continue moving forward you're like learning something new about yourself every single day like you get triggered by something and you're like oh why did that affect me that way and then you're like oh yeah oh god why oh, did- yeah i've just got a flashback of a memory when i was like seven and this happened yeah exactly and it's like holy shit how long have i been holding that back there for yeah exactly and you get shocked by the it's things really- that you remember about yourself and mm. the things that you realize you've put up with for a lot of your life mm. and the choices you've made based on things that happened to you back then for how much of your life and it's it's one thing to acknowledge that and reflect upon that and have awareness of it and it's another thing to really utilize that harness it and then spread that that um, inner knowing of yourself and show other people how to get that inner knowing for themselves mm, as well and yeah. to like spread that, I don't know what better word to say is it, but that love of healing because yeah. I think a lot of people relate healing their trauma to something that has to be scary and negative and it has to be this horrid, scary thing. But sometimes it can be just as beautiful as it is scary. Yeah. And it, it, it leads to such a richer life and yes, there might be more emotions involved, but it's an emotionally rich life. Yeah. Um, and I just think that like what she's doing in the world is truly amazing. And yeah. honestly, I just, I'm in awe. I said it a hundred yeah. times during the episode, but I was actually, I'm someone that likes to talk a lot clearly, overly explain things, but I just sat there and I, I there was nothing additional to add because she no. literally just, she, she just she said was, it. Yeah. She, she left me it. speechless. And we're like, yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Wow. What? Like I was actually just like just no, taking it all in. I'm like, wow, this is the exact human I want to be one day. Yep. And I'm I know I'm on my way of becoming, but it's just so beautiful to see someone that I would consider a mentor in my life now yeah, most in front of me. Definitely. Yeah. But Angela, we freaking love you, man. We love you so much. And you are not a bitch. You are not a bitch, Linda. You are not a bitch. You are not a bitch. You have every reason to live your life and want the things you want in your I life know. and to leave Robbie. You don't, you don't have to marry a wedding singer. Yeah. <laughs> leave Richfield. Yeah. <laughs> leave Richfield. I leave say. Leave it. <laughs> but seriously, we. Seriously. I, I totally understand Linda's point of view from a whole different perspective now. Yeah. And you know what? If she wanted to take that side of the the seat on the plane, she's allowed to look out the window every time. Yeah. If that's what she wanted to do. Yeah. She was dreaming of a different life. Yeah. <sighs> guys, you guys really have to watch The Wedding Singer if you haven't. So I don't understand good. why anyone wouldn't have watched it by this point in your life, but please go watch it. Yeah. You're, you're really just like... Missing not, out. Not living. <laughs> <laughs> you're really missing out. <laughs> Get inside and out from nature and watch the movie, goddammit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right, guys. I'm going to leave all of Angela's details in the pres- in, in the prescription I was gonna say, <laughs> in the description down below so that is um her healing school website all of her social media and the social media for the healing school as well so really important to check that out and support that cause um because they're just angela's just doing amazing things if you want to hear any of the songs that we mention in any episode they'll be in our spotify playlist in the description as well yes they will be and i do have some one-on-one coaching spaces available feel free to send me a message if you're interested please do but yeah all of that is in the description below great woo all right l that's it we are done for today hurrah huzzah Huzzah. Huzzah. see you guys next week see you next week bye 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 bye